Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm, I'm really flattered to be in Silicon Valley and to have somebody pronounce my name correctly. It doesn't happen in Brussels very often, so thank you very much, Eric. Thanks to Mind the Bridge, to the EIT, all the partners behind it. I mean, Alberto and Marco, they've done a tremendously good job, and I, I mean, I must say it's, a, it's been a fascinating experience uh, over the last, say, three, four days. I must also admit this is the first day I'm actually wearing a tie, and I was about to take it off, but it now serves to hang my microphone on, so I, I'm going to wear it uh, for the rest of my, my presentation. Just, just kind of very briefly, because the digital single market is a huge subject, so I'm going to give you some flavor of what's behind it and where we are. But before I, I do so, I mean, I wanted to just give you some kind of general indications where Europe stands at this moment. Last week, Jean-Claude Juncker, who's the Commission President, gave his State of the Union speech in front of the Parliament, so 750 plus members of Parliament. How, what is the State of the European Union? And it was interesting that for the first time since quite a long time, the State of the European Union is positive. Uh, we have had our political challenges, I mean, but, but now, I mean, certainly populism is a bit on the back foot, at least for the moment. And economically, very importantly, uh, Europe is doing relatively well. I don't know how many of you know that the last four years, actually, the EU economy has outperformed the US economy, both in growth and employment. So that's always positive. I'm not saying that here to boast, but if you kind of come from a position where the economy is doing well, then at least also in terms of reforms, it's easier to move forward. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker said, the wind is back in Europe's sails. Next week, we have the Estonian presidency. Our heads of state and government are traveling to Tallinn in Estonia to talk about the digital economy, which is really interesting. We have our heads of state and government, so Angela Merkel, Macron, all the heads of state and government go to Tallinn to talk about how to make sure that Europe is successful in the digital economy. I think it's very telling that, that that's something that what we called in Europe is, is chef sache, something on the agenda of the heads of state and government. What will they talk about in more detail? Well, they'll talk about the digital single market and how we are doing. And if there's one thing I would like you to retain from my presentation, it's that what is the digital single market? And it's actually very easy for an American audience to understand because you already got one in the US and we are working on getting one in Europe, it's a single market where it is as easy to operate in one member state as it is to operate in all member states, uh, where you have no fragmentation. At the moment, we still have fragmentation. Rules differ between member states. So it's consumer protection differs, taxation, value added tax differs, company law differs, IPR, copyright differs, differs. So we're trying to what we call harmonize. It's an interesting word, harmonize, because it has the word harmony in it. We try to align the rules more um, across, the, across the board. And, and why is that important? Because I think, as Eric said, we need to have scale and speed. Why is Europe not yet a successful player in the internet economy? Because we have a system in Europe that slows us down. And, and I mean, if you want to grow fast, I mean, you cannot afford just constantly starting up. Uh, this is effectively what many startups have to do in Europe. You are successful in Germany, you want to expand, expand into France, you have to go do it again with new rules, different rules you're not familiar with, different tax administrations, etc. So that we want to avoid. We want to avoid a situation as a European startup, you have to come to the US first, like was the case for Spotify. They started in Sweden, successful. They came to the US, they got scale, then they came back to Europe and they covered the rest of the European territory. We want to be sure, we want to make sure that they can, or the future Spotify's, can scale up fast in Europe. And then of course they can still come to the US, so that's, that, that's great, but, but they, it's not because they have to, it's because they want to. The digital single market is not just about businesses. It should also benefit consumers. I mean, I don't know whether you're familiar with roaming, but it's been a pain in the backside for a long time for Europeans. It's now history. As of the middle of June, I mean, if you go from one member state to the next, 
You can freely use your smartphone. You don't have to be afraid with, for bill shock when you get back home. Um, we have also measures on geo-blocking, which is a particular phenomenon in the European Union. You want to buy something from an e-commerce website in another member state, they geo-block you. You're not allowed to kind of find a bargain and do a business on another website in many cases. Only one-third of the transactions in Europe cross-border are successful from a consumer point of view. We also have what we call the Netflix directive is that if you have a Netflix subscription in one member state, you can take it and enjoy it when you are in another member state. That's not yet the case. So it's also important that the digital single market works for our consumers and our citizens. 38 initiatives, 20 of them legislative. So this is kind of legislation which has to go through the council and the parliament and we are making good progress. I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done, but we are on track. The second point that the heads of state and government will talk about is how to turn Europe into a thriving data economy. Well, there's a number of ingredients you need to be a thriving data economy. I mean, you need good connectivity, uh, which we have in some areas or in many areas in the European Union, but not in all areas. So we need to invest more in high-speed internet. We need to make sure we are ahead with 5G, which is going to completely revolutionize the way we communicate. It brings a whole lot of new opportunities. And we also need, and I mean, this is maybe a little bit technical, we need to have high performance computing capacity in Europe. There is a, I mean, we talked about the Olympics with innovation. There is also a ranking of high performance computing capabilities and if you look at Europe say over the last five to ten years you would see that we have been moving in the wrong direction. Uh, our best performer at the moment is number 11 on the world ranking and that's a bit the difference between a Ferrari if you're number one and I don't know you know Kia Picantos here or <laughs> Fiat Pin, uh, Pandas I mean that's the bit the difference that you're talking about. That we cannot afford in Europe. We cannot become dependent on high performance computing capacity in third countries. We need to have our own high performance computing capacity and that's why the European Union, the European Commission and member states will come together, invest at least 5 billion euros over the next couple of years to be back in the top three by the early 2020s. Well, we want to digitize our industries, our public services, and we talk, when we look at Silicon Valley, we see all the success with the social media and so, Europe has a, I mean, it's streets behind. But if you look at, say, what I think you call in the US the industrial internet, it's still all to play for. Uh, there is still a lot of opportunity. I mean, you see it in the car industry. I mean, who is going to disintermediate? Who is going to provide the services for the connected vehicles, etc.? Well, Europe wants to be a big player in this space. We don't want to end up like we have ended up in the social media with Facebook. That, I mean, to to develop a second Facebook in Europe is impossible, or virtually impossible. We want also to ensure that in sectors such as health, public transport and energy, and these are strong sectors in Europe, they're publicly funded strong sectors that when they digitize, we can get better healthcare at lower cost. So there's a lot of emphasis in Europe about getting it right and getting the digitization in these sectors because they bring benefits across the board, including for many startups. So major efforts are underway. Last week, for example, the Commission proposed a what we call free flow of data initiative so that data within the European Union can flow freely so that these economies of scale and scope can be fully utilized. You don't have to park your data in different clouds depending on where you operate. So that's the second thing our heads of state and government will talk about, how to boost, how to give an impulse to the, the data economy in Europe. Third, security, trust, privacy. How do we make sure that this is a trusted environment? And of course, this is about data protection, the general data protection regulation, which will enter into force in May of next year. We all have to be prepared for, both kind of in the EU and outside. It's about high levels of consumer protection. Yes, we want it to be harmonized, so we want to have like single rules, but we don't want these rules to be low. We want these rules to be high so that consumers can have confidence when they, for example, make purchases on e-commerce websites. Cybersecurity, I don't need to spend so much time on it, but in the EU, 
obviously the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So member states need to cooperate. These organizations, what we call them computer emergency response teams, they need to exchange information. They need to be well prepared so that if there are threats or, 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 or attacks that they cooperate and, and mitigate as much as possible the effects of those attacks. A, a, a very important challenge is the Internet of Things. Uh, huge opportunities when all these devices get connected, they produce data, which again can help us to develop new services, new innovations. But we also, of course, create another vulnerability because these, as we have already seen, these objects can be hacked, can be used for distributed de denial of services attacks. So we need to be absolutely sure that these objects are as secure as possible. And here the Commission last week proposed some kind of certification standards to, to, to make sure that they do meet the high levels of security that consumers and users expect. There's also illegal, harmful content, fake news, but real fake news, not, not kind of fake fake news, as kind of sometimes the, the term is here in the US. I, there is, that, that's a societal challenge of, of very high proportions. I mean, in the EU we've had, we've suffered a number of terrorist attacks recently. This is very high on the political agenda. The platforms are under pressure to do much better than they have done so far. And I would not rule out that at some point the governments will say this is an area so important we need to regulate this. We need to impose some obligations on the platforms to make sure that the internet is a space where these types of expressions, uh, of course always in full compatibility with the freedom of expression, but these type of kind of illegal content or, or, or harmful content uh, uh, cannot thrive, cannot breed. Fourth, fairness. One of the issues that the heads of state and government will discuss next week is internet taxation. Uh, the internet, the kind of the digital economy is putting huge strain, is causing major headaches in, with tax authorities. Because in the past, life was simple. You had a physical presence, you, whatever you did, your economic activity, you turned a profit, you were taxed on the profit. Today, it's much more difficult. You don't need to be physically present in a country. You can provide your service across border. It's intangible. You can move. You can what they call tax optimize, you can do your tax op optimization and end up paying very little taxes in Europe. Well, that's of course a key concern, key concern to finance ministers, but a key concern more generally about fairness. I mean, we live in an age of populism. People will want to see that the state stands up also for the little man, that we continue to have enough resources to invest in our education systems, in our health, in our infrastructure. And people will not accept, and politicians will not accept, that these new big players end up paying much less tax than also the ones that they are competing with. So there is a fairness level playing field issue that will need to be addressed. Fifth, and I, I'm saying fifth because I said one thing you had to recall or to retain was the digital single market, what we were trying to achieve, and there's the primacy effect and the recency effect, so maybe you missed all the middle, but you shouldn't miss the end of it, which is people. This is all about people. I mean, we talked a lot during the last couple of days about talents. Of course, it's important to have talent, but we've got a population in Europe which 40% is digitally illiterate. 40%. I mean, if this was normal literacy, people who couldn't read or write, we would say scandal, totally unacceptable. We cannot have a situation again where these people are left by the wayside. I mean, we need to make sure that our population is prepared, that they can benefit from these opportunities. And this puts kind of huge expectations on our education systems, on our skills, words like lifelong learning. I mean, something where we need to work together with our member states, with the the industry as well, with, with the kind of the government, European authorities, to make sure that the internet will be seen as a force for the good by the general population. Because if the internet is seen as very disruptive, which it will be, and governments have no answers to the expectations of people, you see kind of whole sectors, people being shaken out, and, and no safety net, nothing. Well, the safety nets that we normally have in the European Union, I mean, we will see a backlash uh, against digitization. So those are the issues that the heads of state and government will concentrate on next week. It's a big agenda. 
a very big agenda. Uh, but the good thing is there is momentum. There is a sense of urgency. There's very strong political support. I mean, we've, we've got other issues in Europe. I mean, the heads of state and government, it's not that they haven't got enough to do. They haven't got enough on their plate. Say, so, well, let's talk digital. They, they talk digital because they believe it's absolutely fundamental to the success of the European Union in the future. And I, I, I mean, heard a lot kind of failing is good. Yes, failing is good if you're a startup and you fail and you start again. Here, I mean, governments cannot afford to fail. I mean, this agenda needs to be delivered. Uh, this, this is too important because at the end of the day, what this is about is our quality of life in Europe, our standard of living, the kind of co society we want to live in. And so this has to be delivered. Failure is not an option. We can't stop the technology. We've got to get this right. With this, I quit, and I'm going to give my microphone back, and then you'll see me again, I guess, on the panel. I should... Yeah.